Good morning, everyone. And we're going to just wait a few more seconds to get everyone time to get settled in and log on. It's good to see everyone here today. Good morning, Julia, Elizabeth, mm -hmm. Mike, Brian, mm -hmm. Louise, here, Dr. Gibson, Amy, Rachel, it's good to see you. Robin. Robin. Dr. Dr. Pearson. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Ms. Jabal. Mm -hmm. Give it just a few more seconds before we get started. Beverly Lloyd. Okay. okay, I'll go ahead and get started so I can be respectful for everybody's time today. Uh, my name is Egypt Lloyd, and um, along with my father, Dennis Lloyd and other members of the Lloyd family. And we established the Slave Legacy History Coalition, for those who don't know, in the year of 2021. And it's for to provide easier access uh, to information and resources on the legacy of slavery before and after emancipation for the families of slave descendants and the general public. We are uh, so excited uh, to have Emily Javalt today to speak. Um, but before um, I turn it over and introduce uh, our speaker today, um, I will invite everyone to put their information in the chat who's visiting us for the first day so we can thank you. Um, and I will also turn it over uh, to Naomi Gordon um, to give you uh, any announcements that we have today. So Naomi, over to you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, so the Faith and Veritas gathering that happened a few weeks ago um, at the Harvard Club of New York uh, with Egypt, Dennis, and Julia. Um, yeah, happened a couple weeks ago and some images are available um, from that gathering on our website and also on the newsletter. And as a reminder for the speakers for next month will be Rachel Boyle from uh, Shirley Eustace House. And in January, we have Catherine Matthews from Old North Illuminated. Um, and if anybody else has announcements, I um, invite you to share that in the chat and also send us an email, which I will drop in the chat. Um, and I think that's it from me. Um, I will turn it back over to Egypt to introduce our speaker today. Uh, great. Dad, did you have anything that you wanted to add before? No, 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 I okay. don't. Uh, just thank you to everyone. Okay, okay great. <laughs> uh, yes. So, yes, today we are so excited uh, to have uh, Amy Javalt, who is a curatorial chair of collections and curator of folk art at the American Folk Art Museum. Uh, Emily is uh, a doctoral candidate at the University of Delaware in the Art History Department, where her work has been supported by Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Curatorial Track PhD Fellowship. Uh, today, her presentation will be on the unnamed figures of Black presence and absence in the early American North in the opening this coming November uh, with an accompanying book for which she served as a contributing editor. So Emily, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so glad to have you here today, um, along with your mother, Mrs. Jabal, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Egypt and, and Dennis and all the Lloyds for 
uh, for your participation in this project, which I'll talk a little bit more um, this morning in my presentation, but thank you so much for the invitation. It's a real honor. Um, I, I'm from Cambridge originally myself, and, and so um, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to, to share some of our research um, with folks who I know will recognize the places and, and some of the names that I'm going to be talking about. Um, but I wanted to give you a, a broad overview of our project, which, as Egypt said, is both an exhibition um, here at the American Folk Art Museum. We're installing uh, just outside the door of, of my office here. So as we speak, pictures and objects are being put in place for the show. And I hope some of you may be able to visit um, the exhibition while it's on view here in New York through the end of March or um, in um, over the summer, it will be traveling to historic Deerfield. So a little bit closer to home for those of you um, who might uh, have an easier time seeing it in Massachusetts. Um, but I'm, I'm so thrilled to be here. I do want to acknowledge I'm just one of a curatorial team of three. So I'm so only sorry I'm not sharing the stage with my my colleagues Shade Ayarinde and R.L. Watson, who have um, who have been partners um, on this project throughout its inception, which um, uh, was really almost six years ago now that um, since I, I began the initial research uh, for the show as part of my doctoral work. Um, but um, most broadly speaking, and I'm going to pull up my slideshow here, so you have something. Um, thing to look at. Um, most broadly speaking, this is a show about African American representation in the early American North, um, including New England and also uh, the Mid-Atlantic as um, uh, giving special focus to uh, an understudied region in um, the understanding of, of African American history. Um, in particular, also looking at an earlier time frame than is usual for um, for looking at Black history. So not not only the 19th century, but also the 18th century. Um, I think we can recognize um, easily that Black figures and faces do seldom appear in American art of the 18th century. Um, and when represented, they're often placed in secondary positions, subjected to Marginaliz marginalization and portrayed as, as lacking individuality. Often these are figures that go unnamed um, and ex implicitly are excluded from the story of the picture. Although initiated by the um, works makers and originally intended consumers, this kind of compositional sidelining has been reinforced by histories of interpretation um, through narrative repetition, white representations uh, continue to be referenced as the dominant point of interest by art historians and museum professionals over time. Uh, incorporated into portraits of elite white sitters, enslaved and free Black servants have continually been described only as accessories to power. In landscapes, small Black staffage figures have been dismissed as incidental. Countless unseen men, women, and children inhabited the spaces referenced in such pictures, but were never depicted at all. So the central question of the exhibition is, what if we actively choose to refocus our attention and to center interpretation on questions about Black presence and absence, even though the answers to these questions may sometimes elude us? In reorienting our approach to such depictions and essentially demanding something new from old pictures, can we locate symbolic value in early American Black figures for the present moment as cues to the historical presence of Black individuals and their overlooked experiences? So with these questions in mind, the show gathers over 120 never before assembled works, including portraiture, needlework, works on paper, sculpture, photographs, and other vernacular forms, tracing histories of Black representation as subjects, both central and peripheral. The imagery in the show ranges broadly, as you can see, um, and this is really according to the complex scope of historical depictions of Black people in America. Interpretation directly acknowledges histories of enslavement, racism, and oppression, 
but these hard truths are balanced with opportunities for remembrance uh, and um, uplifting stories of Black persistence, um, in, including powerful, sensitive portrayals like the ones that you're seeing here. The selection of works, as I mentioned, gives special focus to the early New England and mid-Atlantic regions due to uh, the historical um, uh, misperception of the, the uh, 19th century South as the singular site of early Black American history. An introduction in the opening gallery will define the geographical scope of the show through a selection of works from Northeastern colonies and eventually states, including Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, and New York. Um, one example is from the American Folk Art Museum's own collection, this depiction of uh, the house of a wealthy Massachusetts shipbuilder, Joshua Windsor, whose uh, house was located in Duxbury, then uh, a maritime and shipbuilding center. Um, although this uh, sort of house portrait, we might call it, was originally intended, like many similar pictures, to emphasize the wealth and prominence of a white family, of the white property owner, the picture also includes the presence of a Black woman, perhaps the single person of color who's recorded as a member of the Windsor household in the 1790 census. Although black populations in New England were small at this time, this image indirectly recalls the centrality of the slave trade to building the local economy, which of course, as you know, drew its prosperity from the triangular trade with Africa and the West Indies. Enigmatically facing away from the viewer here, this woman's figure also conjures for us the under-recognized contributions of so many Black Northerners whose stories are part of the fabric of our local histories. Shifting our focus to center Black figures in such images, we locate new ways of understanding familiar pictures. This is... Um, uh, quite a well-known needlework picture in 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 uh, the world of needlework aficionados, and it's uh, really an icon of early American needlework, which has long been interpreted um, either in terms of historical interiors, because you can see there's lots of information about um, uh, what a what the interior of a house would have looked like. Uh, it's also been interpreted in terms of the biography of its maker, the white woman who's seated at the center of this depiction in um, what is essentially a, an autobiographical image depicting the uh, the birth, life, and death in the form of the coffin, the adult figure at the table, um, and the cradle. Um, but as I said, this has typically been interpreted in terms of this white woman's life. But of course, on the right, rocking the cradle, we see a Black nursemaid um, who may well be a reference to a woman named Jane Cato who was enslaved within this Connecticut household when the needlework was made uh, around the time of the revolution. In our label text for this work, we lead visitors into a consideration of Jane Cato's perspective. Although this is likely the only pictorial representation of her to be made, Cato did not rely on the Punderson family to define her personhood as this composition might have us believe. She would go on to secure her freedom. She would marry twice. Um, remarkably, she produced a will which begins with a simple self-assertion, I, Jane Cato. Um, as we write in the exhibition label, these traces of someone who otherwise might have been absorbed into the life of another insist on recognition then and now. I've offered these two initial case studies as examples of how the show will invite the visitor to look differently, to look critically at the works on view as products of white artists and patrons that can nonetheless carry the possibility of telling black stories. Following this introduction, the exhibition narrative continues with a section on the tropes of early portraiture in which black figures were often included uh, according to a European model um, known as the black page in quotations. So a typical composition uh, shows a black child gazing at a white adult, emphasizing the authority of the sitter in contrast to the enslaved figure's servile role. 
So this is a trope that was less common on, on this side of the Atlantic, but it was an artistic convention that made its way to the British American colonies by the turn of the 18th century. Um, and we believe that images like this were intended to connect isolated Anglo-American colonists to the supposedly sophisticated fashions of, of the European art world um, of cosmopolitan centers abroad. At the same time, I think that we can look at these paintings as an opportunity to explore the realities of Black experience in New England and the Mid-Atlantic. In the background of this otherwise conventional portrait made for a wealthy Bostonian merchant in the late uh, 17th century, in the background, we can see a miniaturized black figure. I can't overemphasize how unusual this composition is. When we see black figures in white portraits, most often it's following this convention that I was just discussing. But this um, really uh, singular compositional um, choice suggests to me that it was the white sitter who actually asked to have a black figure included in his portrait. He's, he's depicted in, with great specificity, standing behind a stack of account books as though he might have been um, a young clerk in training working for this merchant. He has pens at his disposal, paper, account books. So to me, the specificity of this figure very much suggests that this was a real person, someone living in the Shrimpton household. It is documented that there were numerous enslaved people living and working for the Shrimptons. Could this be a man named Dick, whose name appears more than once in these family papers? Um, is it a man named Robin, for whom we know a coat was made by Shrimpton's tailor at the end of the 17th century? Or was he one of the 14 other unnamed Black people documented in the 1713 will of Samuel Shrimpton's widow? We can't answer these questions definitively. But asking them brings us into a contemplative interaction with the histories of Black Boston. As I said, it's really remarkable that the Black youth here is stationed behind a table with account books and other writing materials. Um, unlike so many enslaved laborers further south, this youth is, is given access directly to the tools of literacy, which could have been a form of agency and education for him. These are not circumstances that are unheard of in colonial England. A man named Caesar Linden, who was enslaved in Newport, uh, was known to have been entrusted with household business records, and his work survives in the form of a small account book preserved by the Rhode Island Historical Society, where you can read about uh, daily transactions, including organizing a picnic for, um, for his friends. So a lot to be revealed when you start asking questions of images like this. Um, oh, I, I just want to add this portrait is in the collections of the Massachusetts Historical Society, and it had been in storage, but in preparation for the exhibition, it's been cleaned recently, which offers an even more um, accessible representation of the Black youth and, and illuminates all the better this um, unusual depiction. Uh, an adjoining gallery will shine a spotlight on the work of Black makers in the 18th and early 19th centuries, uh, who were often working in vernacular formats that have themselves been subject to marginalization over time, including uh, stoneware pots, decorated powder horns, and uh, cut out paper um, silhouettes, such as this profile that you're seeing on the left of the skillful Black Philadelphia silhouette cutter, Moses Williams, who worked for um, a white artist, Charles Wilson Peel, first um, as a, an enslaved worker, but later as um, an emancipated um, silhouette cutter. This gallery also tells a remarkable local Massachusetts story of Prince Dima, uh, who was an enslaved portraitist in Boston, um, and whose biography has really only come to, to public attention in recent years. The, this, this portrait, along with um, a portrait of um, Christian Barnes's husband, who were the enslavers of the painter, are both in the collection of the Hingham Heritage um, uh, or the Hingham Historical Society 
And um, these works will be on view outside of Massachusetts for the first time when they travel to New York. So um, we know a little bit about Dima's life uh, through um, traces of the archive, like a newspaper advertisement placed by the Barneses as enslavers um, in which they proclaim Dima's extraordinary genius and offer his services to the people of Boston. Um, they also um, sent Dima to London to um, to train with a painter named Robert Edge Pine, who may have himself have been um, partly of African descent. So a really interesting and unusual story here with Prince Dima. You might be wondering what's happening in this particular picture with the damage to the chest of this woman. The Barneses were loyalists and there was actually quite a bit of slashing of paintings um, around the time of the revolution as an expression of patriotism. Many loyalist paintings had eyes scratched out or hearts slashed through. And um, the Hingham Historical Society made the decision to preserve that damage, which I think is a really interesting and um, smart choice to, to preserve the history of this moment of, of violent rupture that took place that I think makes very evocative the history of the Revolutionary War as it relates to these paintings, and indeed as it relates to the life of Prince Dima, who was able to self-emancipate during the revolution, um, in part as a result of the fact that his enslavers fled. Um, so he himself enlists in uh, the Patriot cause and um, dies young, likely um, in uh, during his, his time um, fighting for the Patriot cause. This is these are um, this is just one of three paintings known to have survived by Prince Dima's hand. Another Boston-based artist stands out through these woodcut illustrations, which are inscribed. You can see with the initials PF at the bottom of the image on the left. Um, Peter Fleet was an enslaved printer. Um, recalled as an ingenious man who cut on wooden blocks all the pictures which decorated the ballads and small books of his master or his enslaver, um, Thomas Fleet. Also in this gallery will be a consideration of Black representation in needlework, which looks at how young girls were really taught to duplicate society's racist vision of Black people as marginal, as you can see here in this family portrait of George Washington, which includes a depiction of his enslaved valet, um, Christopher Shields, standing to the right of the family um, at the outskirts of this depiction. Um, of course, as we know, George Washington was a major slaveholder, and when he died, his estate was home to 317 enslaved people. Um, Christopher Shields was Washington's personal servant who traveled with him to Philadelphia, um, during his presidency. This particular image is based on a popular painting at the time. Um, and uh, although it shows Washington likely um, uh, at his home in Mount Vernon, um, as, as we can see represented in the, the map um, that Martha Washington is pointing to, uh, this needlework picture was made in Newburyport, Massachusetts. So demonstrating the far reach of images that naturalized enslavement, even as the practice had ended in New England, or at least um, partly ended, because as we know, slavery would continue to be legal in Connecticut until the middle of the 19th century. At the same time, we also see how Black schoolgirls might use needlework as a kind of radical form of resistance, as in the case of this sampler made by um, a girl named Sarah Harris who stitched her family tree in this genealogical work as a powerful testament to her family's history during a time when Black relationships were legally and culturally subject to constant undermining. Especially remarkable about this example is the fact that the needleworker was herself an activist. She bravely became the first Black girl to gain admittance to the Prudence Crandall School in Canterbury, Connecticut. Another major thematic consideration are issues of presence and absence in the northern landscape. With an example such as this uh, picture by Winthrop Chandler, who uh, was a Connecticut artist, 
we zoom in on the appearance of Black figures in spaces that have historically been overlooked as sites of Black residents, such as rural Connecticut, um, where, in fact, the painter grew up in a slaveholding household himself and would have encountered numerous Black individuals. At the same time, we will challenge visitors to imagine Black presence, even within pictures that are void of human figures. This landscape has historically been interpreted in terms of the wealthy white family who owned the house, which you're seeing at left, and the general store on the right um, that are depicted here. It also offers us an opportunity to remember the free Black Phillips family of this same town, New Milford, Connecticut, whose agricultural work gave shape to and maintained this landscape that we're seeing. So although it has become very naturalized to talk about this picture in terms of the white wealth that we're seeing on view, just as much of this picture um, is really shaped and constructed by the work of Black families, and in particular, the Phillips family, who had ongoing um, transactions with the, the, the white landowners here, the Boardmans. Um, we have records of those transactions through surviving account books that testify to all the comings and goings at this shop on the right. And the Phillipses were often um, trading their labor for goods um, that they picked up at the Boardman store. Um, so they were really responsible for um, not only doing agricultural labor for the Boardman family, but also for engaging in all kinds of public works projects around um, the building of, of bridges and roadways um, to facilitate commerce and ongoing improvement of infrastructure in New Milford. We've been really lucky, um, as is the case in several other instances in the show, um, to be able to interview descendants of related families um, and present those descendants' family memories um, and responses to these images as part of, of their interpretation. In this case, we have a really striking quotation from a descendant of the Phillipses named Bonnie Johnson, who speaks about her experience of this landscape. When I first saw it, she said, the image doesn't look like it's inclusive, but as I thought about it and looked at it more, it also gives me a sense of place. I'm from there, I grew up there, my ancestors have been there as long as white New Englanders have. Eleanor Meyer, who descends from people both enslaved by and um, uh, related to the Van Bergen family of upstate New York, shares reflections with us on looking at this early 18th century painting um, of the Van Bergen family homestead. She, uh, which which depicts um, ancestors of hers, uh, likely black and white. She says powerfully, it's like all of a sudden there's a hand on your shoulder, tapping you on your shoulder and saying, here I am. Of course, another instance where we're so fortunate to have the participation of descendants is the case of the Lloyd family and the vassal doll seen here from the collection of the Longfellow House. As many of you know, the story of the Vassal family is an underrepresented but highly important chronicle of Black persistence in 18th and early 19th century New England. Formerly held in bondage by wealthy loyalists living on Brattle Street, Tony and Cuba Vassal would go on to lobby successfully for governmental compensation following the decampment of their enslavers during the revolution. They would become Cambridge landowners, playing an important role in the founding of the Cambridge community known as Louisville, which had been um, between, uh, the, between Huron Avenue and, and Massachusetts Avenue um, in West Cambridge. Tony and Cuba's sons, Darby and Cyrus Vassal, both would go on to become advocates for Black people, taking part in the founding of the Mutual Aid Group, the African Society in 1796, and petitioning for a Black school in Boston. In his old age, Darby would be celebrated as a figure of African-American patriotism and abolitionism. This doll was made by a white girl named Mary Saunders, in Cambridge in the mid 19th century. Um, but this doll, as you might imagine, was not crafted simply as a plaything, but as a retrospective tribute to either Tony or Darby Vassal, 
um, there seems to be some confusion in the Saunders family memory about the two men. And I think as they often were in the community, Darby and Tony may have been conflated in memory. Um, but according to a, an accompanying note that descended with the doll, um, the doll does represent one of the men of the Vassal family. And um, I think was was almost certainly intended for presentation at a fair or other local event. In the early 20th century, we know that the object was exhibited at Christ Church, Cambridge, where Darby Vassal is buried. And this is, for me, where um, this history feels very personal to me as well as someone who grew up going to Christ Church visiting the Longfellow house, going to the Tobin school on Vassal Lane. And yet I never heard these stories as a child. And so I think one of the reasons that this project is so important is the potential that it has to instill these memories um, in others who may not have heard these names. A little bit more about this doll here. Um, as you can see, it's very carefully made. There's meticulous attention has been paid to uh, the historical accuracy of the outfit. But by contrast, we have crude facial features that uh, closely resemble the language of caricature that was being developed at this time in the mid 19th century. Um, this tension between the doll's face and clothing suggests to me the growing disconnect, the disconnect, the growing distance between local black and white communities and their divergent collective memories of earlier black history. At the same time, as Jordan Lloyd has expressed, the memories uh, the survival of this object is a rare and precious testament to the lives of the vassals and being able to display the doll alongside photographs of the Lloyd family and recordings of their perspectives makes this work an especially rich and powerful case study within the show. So if you come to see the show, you'll see we put together um, a slideshow with audio from Egypt and Jordan and Dennis um, that talks not only about the history of Darby and Kuba and Tony Vassal, but also about the um, the ways in which this this doll can continue as an object of memory to speak to um, the extended family history of the Vassal descendants. In the spirit of the show's goals to present a multiplicity of perspectives, these descendant oral histories will be joined by selected quotations from Black contemporary artists whom we asked to respond to certain works in the show. So you can see with this work here, we asked uh, the artist Vanessa German to respond to this mid 18th century portrait. And she powerfully said, I'm curious in this picture about the imagination of the black woman. Where is she right now? While her body is physically present, where is her spirit? As the kind of artist I am, I wanna make the lives whole of the black people I see. There's no way I can look at any of these images and not see myself also. Um, so the interpretation for the show really encourages people to take time and use their imagination and to look deeply um, at these objects and, and understand them on multiple levels. Of course, by necessity, the show will also grapple with racism and the challenge of looking at racist representations addressed throughout the exhibition, but looked at specifically in a particular section on the developing visual vocabulary of racism as it was connected to the gradual emancipation of many enslaved Black people in the North in the early 19th century. So this example you're seeing here is from a racist broadside produced in Boston in the early 19th century, this dates to about 1819, um, which was intended to mock local celebrations of the abolition of slavery. Um, today, these broadsides survive as a reckless, was against the intensifying disdain and even violence of white community members that the documentation of parades like these testifies to Black determination to memorialize and honor their one's own history in spite of ongoing oppression. Other works in the show will grapple with issues of falsified memories, such as this supposed portrait of a Black man, which reveals itself through X-ray to be a doctored image repainted sometime in the 20th century. Americans were able to exercise increasing agency over the representation in the mid-19th century 
even under circumstances of predominantly white control over artistic and material culture. Highlights will include these phenomenal portraits of Black Bostonians, William and Nancy Lawson, as well as a presentation of 50 portrait photographs lent from the Burns Archive, consideration of her portraits from the perspective of a fashion historian, new research on the first uh, known professional Black portraitist, Joshua Johnson of Baltimore, um, and his training, uh, not only as a painter, but as a Blacksmith, um, the activist life of Potter Thomas Comera, based in New York, um, and also the ethical questions of the titling of artworks like this one that incorporate unnamed figures. The book also includes a foreword from Gwendolyn Dubois Shaw, um, the eminent art historian who, who some of you may be familiar with. And as I mentioned, I'm also excited to share the dates for- uh, Thank you so much, Emily, for this fascinating presentation. I will invite um, anyone, anyone that has any questions for um, Miss uh, Emily Javalt to uh, raise your hand or enter it into the chat and we will call upon you, um, me and Naomi. Um, and Emily, really quickly, can you remind everyone the dates um, that they can see this? Yeah, the show opens publicly next Wednesday, November 15th and closes on March 24th. Great, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Dr. Brown, Barbara Brown, you can unmute. Good to see you this morning. Let's see. Uh, oh, well, I'll just yeah. start by saying, wow. Could you do that all over again so I can <laughs> take it in? <laughs> we'll be giving more, we'll be giving more lectures. You can go to the Folk Art Museum website and sign up for further curatorial tours, which will uh, let it all sink in a bit more. Uh, this is unbelievable. <laughs> all I want to do is mention, which other people may know more about, is that um, Harriet Hayden, Lewis Hayden's wife of Boston, she had us, um, she did a series of photographs. And that photographic exhibit will go up at the Boston Athenaeum in the next few months. That's so wonderful um, that you mentioned that because we, we do have a, a scholar who uh, has worked with those photographs, um, who's written a short article for the book. Um, and I believe one of her, one of the photographs from Harriet Hayden's album is um, is included in her essay. Um, so that's something to look for. I don't know exactly when it's gone going up. I was just over there yesterday, and the director of education mentioned it in passing because we were talking about um, Thomas Perkins instead, um, who was co-founder and a slave trader of the. Eth not a slave trader of the Athenaeum, but co-founder of the Athenaeum and slave trader and opium smuggler. Mm -hmm. I have a question of my... Yes. I, I am unmuted. Uh, uh, yes, Emily, thank you. That was a very wonderful presentation and we look forward to visiting um, Folk Art Museum of New York located in Lincoln Square, Lincoln Center Square, right? right. <laughs> <That's> uh, right. <laughs> number nine. Uh, question, just on the doll, the... There's two sides of that, you know, interpretation. And I think we, I don't know if we, but one is that um, clearly when you look at it, that's, you know, a depiction that, you know, was viewed through, you know, uh, enslavers and the general population, white population at that time, you know, big lips, dark skin, which is not, you know, uh, uh, characteristic of, I'm sure, uh, how people looked. Uh, but the other side of that, too, is um, the mere fact that a doll was created. So that speaks to a, a point uh, that, you know, uh, Dobby was, in fact, you know, either well-known or had a presence in many people's lives because uh, to make a doll and then to designate it, you know, as someone, you know, even though it's interpretation, you know, uh, does have its negative points. The positive side is that one was created and it's still being talked about, you know, uh, century, a century later, you know. So um, any comments on that or thoughts on that point? Yeah, no, thank you, Dennis. I mean, I think that's a, a really, really in, um, important, interesting um, 
question and one that, that this actually um, is the central case study of a chapter of my dissertation because I just find there to be so much to unpack here. And this is such a rich and really conflicted object in a lot of ways. Um, the the two sides to that interpretation and, and, and sort of the positive side that you're mentioning, I think, can also really be seen when you look at the larger body of dolls and African-American dolls specifically that were being created at this time. There aren't that many that survive, but there are others. And they do include, you know, figures like Frederick Douglass um, or representations of, um, you know, a black man in a, a naval uniform or some kind of military uniform. So there's often, um, uh, you know, I think these were these were not made as playthings, although there were black dolls being made as playthings, and we have some very interesting collections of those that have been exhibited. Um, but I just think the formality and the specificity of an object like this means that it was meant to be displayed, um, and that it was part of kind of um, it was part of a a, a political activist goal. Um, the Saunders family was certainly uh, in, uh, we don't have too much evidence of, of what they were up to during the Civil War, but enough to see that they were supporting pro-union causes and contributing to local fundraising uh, efforts. Um, William Saunders, uh, the father of Mary Saunders, was also an antiquarian himself. Uh, I, I believe that he was responsible for preserving the Shem Drown rooster um, weather vane, which is on top of, now I'm going to forget the name of that church on the corner of, is it Mason Street and, Gar and Concord Ave? Um, but this was a family that was engaged in, you know, the keeping of historical memory, um, as well um, as political, you know, interest in the, in the union cause. So I think all of that together helps really reinforce the context for this as an intended respectful tribute of a man who was respected and known in the community. Um, so that even though the racist visual vocabulary of the time is coming into the interpretation, and you do sort of also have to think like this was a young girl making this representation. She she wasn't a highly skilled craft person who could really a achieve a true likeness, even if she wanted to. So there are elements of that as well. Um, but yes, I think, you know, it is a it is a conflicted object. And I I think there are probably as as there are with all challenging images, those who will say, well, I don't, you know, I don't want to look at this. This makes me feel uncomfortable. And I understand, you know, why that could be someone's reaction as well. But I think um, our hope is that people will be able to take away multiple messages from the works that they're looking at and, and thinking about on different levels. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. That was, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, thank you very much for that that interpretation. Um, just could you uh, just uh, slide down to the picture of my grandfather? That yes. one that was and I right it. here. I just wanted to point out that is my grandfather, Herbert Le uh, Leroy Wolf uh, Sr., who uh, I lived, we lived with my mother and my aunt and my grandfather. You know, when I was coming up with my sister, we all lived together uh, in Hollander Street on Roxbury. And uh, where he passed away at 25 Hollander Street in uh, 1959. But uh, I was very close with him as a, you know, coming up. Uh, and he passed away when I was about 12, when I was 12. So anyway, this is a picture of him standing in front of a florist shop that he had, that he owned um, on um, Main Street in Charlestown. So, uh, and that- We also include photographs of, um of his wife, Rosetta, who was, right. it was Rosetta's descendant right, right, directly. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. That's who he named the floor shop after too. Right, mm -hmm. and uh, so, but I just wanted to point that out. Yes, thank you. And then of course we have Darby Vessel's signature. We have, of course, the African-American meeting house right. and, um, and a map that includes Christ Church, Cambridge, where Darby Vessel is buried. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. And very, I just, very, very strong, you know, collage here. Thank you. I just wanted to point it out. Mm -hmm. 
Um, let's see. I, there are a couple questions in the chat. I want to see if, oh, thank you, Louise. I don't know. Louise would know the Rooster Weathering is a top first church congregational. Um, and the Shirley Eustace House, the Dell Sparks, an interesting conversation on portrait conventions of the era. Mm hmm. And whether the coloring of the facial features is intentionally derogatory or simply a naive adaptation of an artistic convention that was the product of a racial, racialized dominant culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the portraits of the chubby baby with his nurse and the merchant with the adoring boy, the black figure seemed to me to be painted with more care and realism than the white. Am I seeing this incorrectly? Are the black figures idealized? This is, yeah, that's a really interesting question. So let me um, pull up the images that you're referring to here. So there's there's some very interesting things going on here. I agree. I mean, I think sometimes in these portraits, you look at the black figures and you think this looks like a stock image. I actually think this could very well be a, a, a real person. Uh, I do think it's very sensitively executed. Um, this I I would say though that I think both there's a there's a shared level of attention um to both of these faces. This boy actually was was this is a posthumous depiction of this boy. Um he he died as a child. Um this is actually the son of the painter. So um I think there was probably uh an element of painting from memory that may have contributed to um, the quality of the the likeness that you're seeing here. Um, there's something else really complicated and interesting with this picture, though, is that it descended with a, I'm sure, mythologized history that the child was poisoned by his enslaved nurse. And I just think that's another layer that adds um, some troubling and but interesting um additional context about the fear that um the the fear of uh enslaved rebellion that was an ongoing part of life um but also you know what the experience of this young black woman would have been living in a household where she was being asked to perform the most intimate duties but also at the same time being subjected to this um, potentially violent and often violent fear on the part of the people who were enslaving her. So this is a very interesting and complicated picture too, um, which is being hung as we speak. Um, the other picture, uh, I think that um, this question was thinking about is this this depiction this is a new york portrait um we believe it was made at the time that the artist was imprisoned for debt so um there were you know in new york city at this time a, a large relatively speaking a large black population so i also think it's very possible that this um this the depiction of this youth is based on a real person I agree that this is a sensitive portrayal, but I think it's um, maybe a little bit, I, I've heard a variety of different responses to the way this boy is represented. So I think maybe that one's a little bit subjective. Um, but interesting, we don't know the the name of the white sitter. Um, so there's a limited amount of research we can do, but I, I do think it's potentially metaphorically quite interesting that this is the only moment that this artist chose to represent a person, a, a person of African descent and the men that he was painting while he was in prison were often, um, both abolitionists and slaveholders. So they were members of the local manumission society, but often still enslavers. And so I just wonder if there's something happening here with a reference to the kind of hypocrisy that the painter was seeing, um, since he himself is in a state of captivity at the time. Um, so again, but all about, you know, a white, a white person's perspective and a white agenda and the use of the Black child to serve that agenda. Um, 
that probably just raised even more questions than it answered, but <laughs> some more context for you there on, on those pictures. Mm -hmm. Any other any other questions? Where where can we place the formal non-folk portrait in the Sturbridge Museum? Oh yes, that 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 is in um that is in the show, the portrait of Agrippa Hull. I think is that what you're asking about, Barbara? Yes, um, that is in the show, and I think also a wonderful um, opportunity for people to learn more about Agrippa Hull because that is not a very well known name um, in the popular in popular understanding. Um, and yes, Kit had a question. The black nurse is proffering a piece of fruit. Yes, we think it's a peach, which which was a uh, an imp would have been an important crop for the the family based in in Maryland. But it's not an apple relating to um, being so. thrown out be, of out of Eden. That would be nice, but no, it's definitely not an apple. <laughs> but Agrippa Hull, it's such a formal portrait. So how does that fit into this? Yeah. understanding african-american portrayals at that time that's really that's a really great question so we have a section that looks in particular includes the shelburne portraits of you know as someone mentioned mr lawson is holding a cigar she's holding a book so they're they're you know together at, as a as a white couple might have chosen to represent themselves with accessories that point to their literacy and, and affluence and refinement um those are very unusual portraits Many portraits of of black subjects at that time were still um, being made at the instigation of a white person, and I actually think that's the case with the Agrippa Hall portrait as well. I don't think he sat for that portrait. It's based almost identically on a daguerreotype of him. That's the same exact um, composition, and so I think actually the portrait may well have been made posthumously again, at the instigation of a white person. The oil, the formal oil on portrait, I think still very much remained a white format. I feel like that formal portraiture was still something that um, was sort of the first direction a, a, you know, a white person would go in to have themselves represented. And uh, photography felt more, not only maybe more accessible um, from a financial perspective, but not just that, also, like it was something new and perhaps there was more of an opportunity to have an unbiased likeness made. And, and that gets expressed very powerfully by Frederick Douglass, who talks about his belief that a white man will never be able to really properly capture the likeness of a black man because of bias, because of racism, but that photography for Douglass held, and we know is the most photographed um, American of his time. Frederick Douglass knows from whence he speaks that, um, he felt like photography offered a new opportunity to, for for black folks to have representations that really spoke of who they were. So, in in sort of a culminating display of the show, we will have this wonderful selection of fifty photographs, which you'll be able to see not only the physical photographs, but we'll also have a projection, um, which I think will be a very um, very compelling. Um, way to see these photographs, um, you know, larger than life as well. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So final question maybe from Kit, how long did we work on the project? So at the Folk Art Museum, we've been working at the project pretty much since I joined the museum in 2019. Um, and then I was doing my own um, initial research for the two years prior to that as part of my doctoral work. So yeah, six years, six, six years. years in the making. Mm -hmm. um, I would be remiss not to give a little plug for our book. If you want to learn more about the research we've been doing, I have a copy right here. It has Nancy Lawson on the on the cover. You can order it online at the museum, or better yet, come to the museum and pick up your copy at our shop. Um, at our mm -hmm. shop here mm -hmm. is the. Can we put that in the chat? The, sure. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Information. Um, Emily, that I, is... I just put in the chat that wouldn't it be wonderful if we could arrange a group um, excursion to New York City? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we... that is brings me to my point. Dad. I was just going to say, Dr. Brown, 
that's a good idea. And that's one part of the Slave Lexi Coalition mission is to expand this, um, mm -hmm. our mission, um, including to do something with Dr. Brown suggested to do a tour bus of some sort to bring people to New York and various places. Um, as you know, that we are a nonprofit organization and we greatly uh, appreciate any support that you guys can give. We have our link in um, the chat for our link for donations. It also can be found on our website at www.slavelexyhistorycoalition.org uh, for those that who do not know. And also, if you have any announcements that you would like for us to share on our website, um, a newsletter and with our other members, um, please send those announcements to info at slavelexyhistorycoalition.org. And I do want to give a quick reminder that next month uh, we will have uh, Rachel Hole who, with the Shirley Eustace House, who's here with us today. She will be our next month's presenter, and she is the program coordinator at the Shirley Eustace House in Roxbury. So nice. we are looking forward to that. Um, does anyone have any questions or statement? Um, Emily, thank you again for a fascinating presentation. Um, we thank you for your time. We look forward to seeing you in New York next week. Uh, we thank you for everyone that is here with us today. And Dad, do you have anything you want to say before? Right, I, I do. And thank you, Barbara, for mentioning uh, we were planning a trip uh, to uh, to New York to uh, view the exhibition. Um, and well, just do so that's something that we're definitely you know is on the pipeline to do um and we will be sending out announcements now we uh, whether it's to new york or which we'd like to do um before the exhibition ends in march so uh that'll be on definitely be on the dance sheet you know yeah, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me if anyone is in new york independently and and would like um yeah. would like to organize a tour just let me know absolutely that would be right. great that would be great. wonderful thank you so thank the, you. The, yes and the uh the exhibition runs again that's in lincoln square in new york and and it'll run through march starting march on the 24th yes march 24th well we you. also thank have you. a i'll just say one more thing that we have a symposium so even more research and scholarship um which will be held over two days february 23rd mm -hmm. and march 8th those are both fridays it will be virtual um, so if you want to hear more from the whole curatorial team and from scholars who participated in the project, as well as as other new scholars working on related material, that that's another opportunity, Thank which you. you can find out more on the Folk Art Museum website. Emily, can and you- All these that? meetings will be recorded too. So if you have anything that you might have missed, we will have this upload on our YouTube channel so you can um, visit this uh, can recording again. Can you send that information to us and we'll put it on our newsletter, um, yes. uh, you know, in the same. Yes, and we will. Absolutely. So uh, yeah. we're currently calling. We're currently um, requesting submissions for uh, those who might want to speak at the conference, too, if anyone is, is working on something. Mm -hmm. Great. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you again, everybody, for everyone for coming today. And I look forward to seeing you all next month. And thank you again, Emily. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.